Are you a businesswoman who is finding it challenging to get your ideas across and make a point? Welcome to Speakers Who Get Results with Elizabeth Bachman, a podcast dedicated to helping women get the visibility they want, whether making a speech or talking in a meeting. Every week, get valuable lessons from Elizabeth or learn from her roundtable conversations with experts and speakers on how to make a difference, not just a point. On to the show with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. Hello and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. I'm Elizabeth Bachman, your host, and this is the podcast where we interview experts from around the world on subjects such as leadership, visibility, presentation skills, diversity, and communication challenges. Now, before I move into the introduction for my fascinating guest today, I'd like to remind you that if you are curious about how your presentation skills are working and are they working to get you the results that you want, you could take our free four-minute quiz at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's www.speakforresultsquiz.com. And that's where you can see where your presentation skills are strong and where perhaps a little support could get you better results and the recognition you deserve. My guest today is Sharon Womble King. And it's interesting because we just, we threw this conversation together at the last minute. She's going to be interviewing me. And I thought, wow, she's so interesting. Our our preliminary conversation, I said, wait a minute, I have to interview you. She is a, uh, because Sharon, let me read the official introduction. And then you can see where our conversation took us. Sharon Womble King creates inclusive space for people who, to soar to the zenith of their potential through communication and change leadership. She's a na- native of Berkeley, California with several decades experience in corporate consulting and nonprofit settings. She purposely stimulates aha moments and relishes interpersonal reactions that can uncover nuanced layers of situations to promote personal and organizational transformations. As the president of the Womble King Group, Sharon has brought her keen insights and knowledge about organizational effectiveness and cultural transformation to establish organizations as thought leaders and industry leaders to develop and implement large scale change management strategies and to execute internal, external and multicultural communication solutions related to mergers, acquisitions and divestitures. She's a certified change management leader, an experienced teacher, speaker, and coach. She served in executive leadership roles at several management consulting firms, healthcare insurance companies, health plans, provider delivery systems, and medical groups. Sharon is, uh, her focus on the leadership and governments has also led her to serving as the vice chair of the board of trustees for the University of North Florida, board trustee for Florida Memorial University and the trustee for foundation board of Florida State University. Sharon is passionate about equity and inclusion and is augmenting her professional experience by pursuing a doctorate in the leadership and change program at Antioch University. Her scholarship and expertise is focused on African American women's unique leadership enactment shaped by traditional African ethos and contemporary socialization processes. Sharon Womble King is fascinating. She has a great deal to say about leadership. And we had a really interesting conversation about multicultural leadership, cross-cultural leadership, leading as a woman, leading as a woman of color, and some practical situation, some practical suggestions and strategies for what you can do to elevate your executive presence. So now on to the interview. Sharon Womble King, welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. Thank you so much. I am so glad to have you. We we put this together at the last minute because we had a conversation that was so interesting. I said, 
wait, 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 I have to record this. Let's do this. <laughs> so, um, and both of us, both of us are good talkers. So this is going to be fun. Yes. Before we get into the meat of the conversation, I'd like to ask you, who would be your dream interview? If you could interview somebody who's no longer with us, who would it be? What would you ask them? And who should be listening? My dream interview would be with the Honorable Congresswoman Barbara Jordan, uh, who was the first African-American con- um, person to be elected to the Texas legislature and the first African-American woman from Texas to be elected to Congress since Reconstruction. I would want to ask her about her struggle to achieve what she did in very difficult political, social times. I would want to talk to her about the community of support she had in order to leverage her brilliance. I would want to talk to her about how she embodied the values and the virtues that she communicated so clearly during the Watergate hearings that galvanized the entire country in less than eight minutes that turned around the entire hearing that resulted in President Nixon's resignation. That would be Oh boy, do I want to listen to that. Who do you think should be in the audience? Everyone. Everyone, (laughs) That's what I was going to say, everybody, yeah. Everyone. Everyone who has a zeal for social justice, Mm -hmm. who understands the destructive force of a polarized environment, which is what she lived in. Um, the destructive force of a polarized environment and how to speak truth to power in such a way that it can be heard and acted upon, not only from the cognitive sense, but from the heart. I love it. I love it. Boy, I would totally be in that audience. We definitely want to hear that. Uh, and I think we're going to have to put a link to a Barbara Jordan webpage in the show notes for this. Today, you and I, Uh, We're talking about executive presence because you're going to be interviewing me and I, I want to interview you too. So we have, so we have this conversation. My first question for you is how do you define executive presence? Executive presence is the ability to enact influence in an environment where decisions are being made and you are being experienced as providing value, (laughs) as providing the type of input that everyone in the room needs in order to move forward in a positive way. Executive presence for me is the ability to shift the energy in a room in such a way that people will be galvanized to move in the direction that is the most powerful and aligned to the mission at hand. Uh, That is a marvelous definition, definitely. And... We all know, you and I particularly know, that executive presence also uh, reflects a cultural expectation. You see somebody walk in as a a silver-haired white man in a really good suit, and you're going to assume that he's got executive presence. It's different for women, and it's different for minoritized women. Can you talk a little bit about how how is how can executive presence be defined or experienced for minoritized women who are not part of the dominant culture? And yes, it, it, since we're having a conversation, I think that we also need to define for people what minoritized women are. Please. 
Yes. So in my parlance, I believe minoritized women are those that don't represent the dominant culture of a particular organization. Mm -hmm. Those that don't represent the dominant culture within that setting. Mm -hmm. So within the setting, you could have a board of directors that is very different than the composition of the company. So minoritized women are those that don't represent the dominant of the room that you're in. So if I walk into a room with all able-bodied individuals and I am physically disabled, I am minoritized in that sense. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to broaden the sense of minoritized. We always think of it as, as ethnicity and it is. We think of it as gender and it is, but there are a number of intersections that we need to think about when we think about minoritized women. And, 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 you know, it's minoritized men as well, but today let's just, let's just keep it to women for, <laughs> otherwise it becomes, the, becomes such an enormous subject. Right. Uh, as we're talking about minoritized women, I mean, it's just, this sounds to me like really a, a cultural recognition. Yes. Noticing. Yes. Uh, and noticing how someone might feel like the minority when, um, as opposed to those who just assume that they, there's a whole bunch of assumptions that the majority will be operating from. Exactly. That, um, that the minority is not part of. Right. How the definition of uh, executive presence is influenced by culture. Yes. So when, as I will just use myself as a, an example for a moment. Um, As someone who identifies as an African-American woman, educated, and American in that respect, socialized in the United States, I walk into a room, if I walk into a room where everyone visibly is Caucasian-American, understanding that everyone there is diverse, they all have different um, intersections as well. But if I walk in and I look at everyone there, my immediate question as they look at me is, am I being perceived through stereotypes? Am I being perceived through misperceptions? How are people experiencing me even before I open my mouth? Which everybody will anyway. You know, we all do have bias, so. We all have implicit bias, exactly. But I don't, I can't assume what those biases are. I have to walk in with the flexibility and the ability to think through that room very quickly in a bicultural way. That's the way that minoritized women have been socialized. We think within the dominant culture, the expectation may be ABC. I may not as naturally exhibit those behaviors. So how must I adjust? So here's here's an example that I learned early in in my career. I tend to think in a circular manner. I tend to process in a circular manner. That is because of the way I was socialized and the communication style within my community. Within the dominant culture, we tend to process in a linear form. Mm -hmm. It's one plus two plus three plus four. It's extremely linear, very rational, objective and scientific. I have to know that when I walk in because my presence can be diminished by my speaking in a way that cannot be heard, not because I'm not speaking standard English, but the way I'm processing information. So I need to understand when I walk into the room as a minoritized woman, what the expectations of the dominant coalition what are those expectations 
And then how might it impact me because of misperceptions of she's there because she's a token. She's there because of a affirmative action. She's here because of our diversity initiative, but she's not really here because we expect her to add the same value. Now that may not be the expectation, but I have to think through all of those things. So with that in mind, um, let me just go back to linear and circular for a minute, because that is a huge part of the work that I do. Great deal of what I do is, uh, I think of it as single focused versus multi-focused. And if you are a multi-focused person and you can notice lots of things and you sort of think circularly, as you were saying, then the advantage you bring to a team is that you're going to notice things that the single focus people aren't going to notice. The single focus people, Western business is built on single focus people uh, who can actually get things done in a hurry. They may not notice the, the side issues such as uh, so I had a client who, who said, I sat in that room and I said, does anybody ever ask the client if they want this before we're investing hundreds and thousands of dollars to create this new feature? Does anybody actually ask the client? And, oh, no, they hadn't. They just had gotten all excited about, about this cool idea and they were totally focused on, uh, on getting it done. When you are walking in as a minoritized woman. How much, I'm curious, how much do you think you need to adapt your style to the way they are ready to hear you? And how much can you influence the other people in the room so that they can stretch their thinking, if you will? Yes. So I think there's two answers to your question. It's a fascinating question. So the way you heard my answer was a focus, singular versus multiple. Mm -hmm. The way I was thinking about it was I am trained in my community milieu to tell stories. Mm -hmm. Historically, I tell stories. Everyone in my community we tell stories. And so in the African-American community, you're used to hearing ministers like Martin Luther King, who told stories. Um, he may have been singularly focused, but his communication style was circular. Mm -hmm. So it's both. It is how do you maintain a singular focus so that you can engage those in the room and using the singular focus, be able to tell the story so that you're doing both. You're leveraging a communication style and you're also honoring the way people think cognitively about approaching a problem. So I can ask questions. I can ensure that they know I have the singular focus required, but I have a communication style that is going to approach con conveying that information in a different way, which is why storytelling now is so popular inside organizations. So I want to engage their heads and their hearts, but executive presence from a cultural intelligence perspective means I need to understand what do I need to do to hook them such yes. that then I can be myself. Yes. And being myself in that respect is what is the communication style that I can use in order for them to come alongside with me. Now, I also need to understand to your point, the singular versus the multiple focus but I have to adjust, I have to adjust the communication style for them to hear the value that I bring to the table for their singular focus. Yes, yeah, that, that's exactly what I, I absolutely agree that singular focused people need to learn to adjust to the way they listen and multiple focused people 
need to learn to adapt the way they speak and think, I think, in order to be, in order for them to, to connect with each other. So, yeah. uh, and so isn't really, isn't the question, is, isn't the question, how does one engage those who are different than you? Uh, yes, that is the fundamental question. I yeah. think that is the fundamental question um, of how do we engage the hearts and the minds of those who are different? And that's why, you know, Howard Gardner talks about the eight intelligences. And I think that cultural intelligence is one that is absolutely required for executive women, executives period. Um, and, and culture is not just about ethnicity and gender and those things that we tend to think about socially. Culture is around the ways of thinking, the values, the behaviors, and the patterns that occur in that room. Mm -hmm. So I need to be, and I don't think of it as I'm adapting necessarily, because I, sometimes in, 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 in talking about adaptation, it may sound like assimilation. Mm -hmm. And that may feel bad. But if I'm thinking about how do I engage in a way that opens the door for all of us to provide value to get to the solution, then it's an engagement issue and understanding how, how do the beliefs, the values, the behavior patterns in this room, mm -hmm. how do I leverage those to be able to tell the story that needs to be heard so that we can have a multiple dimension answer? And this is actually where I tend to turn to allies, recruiting your allies, because uh, what they call third party endorsement uh, um, is if there's if if you are a minority and people are going to be judging you, they're going to be trying not to. But there's some sort of implicit bias they are hiding underneath there. Having somebody else back you up makes the difference. Can make can or can make a huge difference. One thing I've uh, you know I've heard from my my colleagues who work full time on helping women get onto corporate boards is that three is the magic number. If you have three women, then then it's not just only one. It's not just those two over there, but if you get three, you're suddenly more a part of the group uh, and you can back each other up as well as bringing in your own, uh, your own relationships, your own value, so that you're not so much of an exception. And I think that is true of particular populations. Okay. Because you may not be able to get an ally within the company. Okay. Um, and I remember very early in my career, um, a senior vice president pulling us all together uh, in an inclusion kind of a conversation saying, allies are really important. And many times your allies are not going to be in the company. Mm -hmm. Your allies and your mentors may be executives who work in other companies where you can feel emotionally safe and vulnerable mm. to be able to have that ally conversation. I think it's an assumption that minoritized women can easily get allies in organizations, not to say that they can't. And that's why I'm just saying it's the flexibility of if you can't get an ally inside where you feel safe and you can be vulnerable for that allyship to occur because some cultures, again, we go back to culture, some cultures are not um, context within the growth mindset where people are not competitive. <laughs> mm, ah, yes. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. And so it is, if you're in a culture where competition and individual effort is valued, it's challenging to get an ally. Mm -hmm. So in order to get someone who can coach you to success, don't give up. You may be able to find someone in the organization, but if you can't, 
there are certainly people outside the organization who can serve as allies for you. Mm -hmm. And all of us know that and do that. So if, if your culture is one that promotes allyship, that works. Mm -hmm. If your culture is one that does not promote allyship, you need a different set of solutions. That's a very good point, actually. It's that if you're if it's a culture where um, the strongest wins, or yeah, for competition, there are a lot of those. It's true. Um, and the scarcity mindset that if you get yeah. something, then I won't. Yeah. And that breeds competition amongst everyone. Yes. Yes. And, and it just makes allyship of any kind challenging. Mm -hmm. So understand the culture. Yeah, understand the culture. That's a very good point. So you, again, how are people, what filter are people listening through? And how do you, uh, and how can you work within that framework? Right. Of course, if you're going to look for allies, you need to be an ally without, uh, without sacrificing yourself if it's one of those super competitive cultures. So um and so let me also say, Elizabeth, it's interesting yeah. because I've, I've talked, a, a lot of us talk about allyship in this space, in the inclusion space. Um, and what I hear from so many women of color is that allyship, mentorship, even this whole notion of executive presence comes with the baggage of not just how I behave in the room, not just being in the room, but it is my clothing. Oh, Yes. It is my, uh, the car that I drive. It's, mm -hmm. it's the whole package that for some minoritized women, that's a very different space to be in. Yes. And again, walking in where people may assume that everybody understands that cultural milieu. Um, I remember uh, someone telling me, I was uh, promoted to vice president and I'm sitting there with a number of other women who are saying, we're going to brunch tomorrow. There's an assumption that you can, that you have a babysitter, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'm going to lunch tomorrow. We're going to lunch tomorrow. Don't you want to come? We're going to XYZ restaurant. We've been there millions of times. It's really great. There's an assumption there. Yes. And then afterwards, we're going to such and such boutique. We go there every week to shop. Mm -hmm. All of those lived experiences are different for different yes. people. Mm -hmm. But that is also the infrastructure for allyship. Mm -hmm. And so understanding, all people understanding that that infrastructure may be different for different people. And therefore the notion of, I need an ally becomes slightly more complicated or mm -hmm. it's just more colorful, if you will. Um, in, in order to be an ally and to obtain an ally. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So the, there's just a lot of assumptions that Someone needs to be able to have the comfort and the vulnerability to have the conversation. And so many people, unfortunately, so many people have never had these kinds of conversations with people who are different. Mm -hmm. And what yeah. I have heard many times is, I don't want to offend you. I don't want to say anything that... Um, is going to be insulting and I didn't mean to. It's, it's all of these uh, fears also in having the conversations that, with people who are different because many of us don't live in communities where there's different people or have social lives, et cetera, et cetera. So the, even the notion of allyship means that we have to have cultures that are inviting to have the kind of open, vulnerable conversations over time, it doesn't mm -hmm. happen immediately. But to have those kinds of conversations where difference is not fear inducing. It's not intimidating. So thank you for going there in the conversation. How can uh, you know how can 
how can we approach without offending? How can we open a channel of communication and say, I really do want to know. Uh, and um, I recognize I'm part of the dom dominant culture, so I don't know how to do it without offense. How, how does one approach that? Well, I have a lot of friends who are different than I am. Mm -hmm. And I try to be open around that. And so I many times have made that invitation. Want to go to lunch? Let's just talk. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we aren't talking about our differences. We're talking about life. Mm -hmm. And as things come up, I'm comfortable talking about, well, you know, that's a little bit different than what I've seen before. Can you explain that? And mm -hmm. just having a, a great conversation around life. And that over time, I think people get more comfortable. And, and of course, you avoid the, the um, tough conversations initially, needless to say. Mm -hmm. But I always say to people, look, we're getting to know each other. I may say something that's offensive to you. I apologize up front. That's not yeah. my intent. You may say something that I don't agree with. Can we now have some ground rules for our conversation mm -hmm. where if I say something that is disagreeable, you can tell me. Yeah. If I say something that is questionable, you can ask me. Mm -hmm. Can I, do I have permission with you to do the same thing? And That's, can we yeah. walk down this road together, understanding that the onus is not on you and the onus is not on me. It's on both of us. Mm -hmm. How do we have this conversation such that we can feel safe? Because that's what we're trying to build. And I've had this conversation many times where the safety issue has to come up soon. I want you to feel safe with me. And if you say something that is biased or offensive, I need to have permission to say that to you. And then we can agree to disagree mm -hmm. or we can agree to have other solutions at the end of this. Mm -hmm. But there has to be a mutual agreement around emotional safety to have those kinds of conversations. That's, that's great. So let's apply this to executive presence and sure. wind this up with... Uh, Being different, knowing that you're different, how can you elevate your executive presence in a culturally aware, culturally conscious fashion? Um, that's a good question. Can you? Yeah. Sure you can. Okay. Uh, but I think that it takes... Um, understanding who you are. Ah, yes. I think it takes understanding your strengths, understanding how you will react both positively and negatively, and being very clear about the boundaries that you have set for compromise. Mm hmm for assimilation, for acculturation. But most importantly for me, it is understanding that the value that I have inside me, if I do not share that in the room, the room has lost a great opportunity. Yeah. So I don't walk into the room thinking, oh, they're not going to accept me. I don't think of all the barriers mm -hmm. when I walk into the room. Because again, for most minoritized individuals, you have fought a good fight to get there. Yeah. And I think I am put into this room for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I am enthusiastic and excited about the ability to do that. And I believe that if you have a presence aesthetically that there's value that I bring to you, that if I don't share it, our solution 
will not be as complete as it should be. The solution may not be as innovative or it may not approach the market and be aligned to the market. There's going to be something terribly missing if all of us don't share that. And that's the way I walk into the room. And so many times the elevation of executive presence is understanding that the behaviors are the table stakes. You've got to know those behaviors walking in the room. And now how do you manage being bicultural? Because I, as we have to be, I am a woman, I am a person of color, I am in an organizational culture and a leadership culture and a culture of this leadership team. And so how do I operate expertly as a person who is managing multiple cultures at the same time, knowing that the value that I bring is so important? And that, to me, elevates my presence. It's not just that I want to be there. It is that I believe that I am going to add value. And that's what's critical to this firm. I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's basically being grounded in who you are and owning your own value. And another thing, as you were talking, it makes me think that the more people know you, as a person, as opposed, instead of that different person, the more they know, they say, oh, that's Sharon. Sharon, you know, Sharon does this and she brings this value, et cetera. The more they will actually listen. So it's getting past the first, the first barriers of you look different. And so the more people recognize that, oh, this is, this is Sharon and who she is. It's, I think, you know, getting in the door is, is the key and then proving that you've got showing people that what you have to offer and how you can do that. It is a dance. It is a tightrope that, that we all walk, but it is a tightrope that can take you somewhere where they suddenly you become Sharon, the person instead of Sharon, the other. And, And that is such a journey. That is a yes. very long it is a journey. journey. Yep. Um, it's a tough journey. Um, and I always say, I mean, people have said to me, well, you know, Sharon, I'm colorblind, which is ridiculous because you're not. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and many times that phrase is added to the conversation in order not to have the confrontation. Mm-hmm. And so what I say to them always is if I looked at a garden and all of the, the yellow daisy said, you know, I'm a daisy, but you know, don't pay attention to this color because you know, <laughs> I'm just a daisy. That wouldn't make any sense. The reason the garden is so beautiful is because the yellow daisy is there. So I want them to pay attention to Sharon, but Sharon brings a set of lived experiences and lived perceptions that may be different and that's okay. The men in the room have those two together. You know, I always use the metaphor together. It's like a pizza. If the pepperoni isn't there, it doesn't taste as good. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly, exactly. No one says, oh, please don't recognize that pepperoni because you know, no one says that. And Mm -hmm. so, so I want them, yes, to accept me for me, but I want them to accept all of me. And the difference doesn't have to be part of the conversation. It is some people, for example, are really good with math. I'm not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> some people really are good with math. I want that difference to be elevated. Mm-hmm. So that's no difference than my difference as, a, as an ethnic minority in the room. So all of us bring so much in. Let's leverage all of it. Now, I want them to see me as valuable through their implicit biases, Mm -hmm. right? That those don't get in the way. But I may have an implicit bias against an attorney. (laughs) Because I don't like attorneys, right? Right. Um, And so all of us are learning how to navigate and negotiate difference. And it's not bad. 
We've mm-hmm. got to get to the place of being comfortable with sameness, with homogeneity, mm-hmm. as well as with the diversity of thought, experiences, and all that. Because we wouldn't be in the room together if we weren't all brilliant. And But we've got to leverage that. So I do want them to get to know Sharon. But I want them to know the whole of Sharon and not ignore that. And I want to get to know the whole of them and not ignore that. Because together, there can be ideas that come up because of it. Does that make sense? I think that makes perfect sense. Sharon Womble King, I could talk to you for the next five hours, but that's going to make this way too long a recording. So let's, I'd like to wind this up. Uh, Do you have one tip for someone who's, trying to cultivate executive presence, uh, one thing to start with? The one thing that I would start with is know yourself. Amen. Amen Know yourself. Understand that who you are and cultivating the internal executive first Mm -hmm. allows you to have the presence of the executive in the room. Excellent. Sharon Womble King, thank you so much for having been a guest on Speakers Who Get Results. This has been Speakers Who Get Results. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Bachman, your host. And let me remind you that if you're curious about how your presentation skills are helping you, or maybe not, you can take our free four minute quiz at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's www.speakforresultsquiz.com. And there in four minutes, you can see where you are strong as a presenter and where perhaps a little bit of support could help you get the results and the recognition you want and that you deserve. This has been Speakers Who Get Results. I'll see you on the next one. We have just concluded another great episode of Speakers Who Get Results with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. If you got value from today's episode, please feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues. You may also visit elizabethbachman.com for additional resources. Be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. And thanks for tuning in.